Don't worry, we're, all, we're only going to be here like another year. It'll be fine. <laughs> no. Uh, but just to kind of catch everybody up on what's going on. Jesus, this is the week of the resurrection. This would be Tuesday of the resurrection. My personal opinion is I believe Jesus would have been about 24 hours or less from being on the cross. I believe he was on the cross on Wednesday. Some people debate on that if it was Wednesday or Thursday. I personally believe it was Wednesday. I can show you my timeline. I sat here. I, I made a timeline out because I wanted to get it straight. I'll show anybody the timeline. I'll give it to you. It's, it's the timeline I've worked out just using scripture and just to try to understand it. But this would have been Tuesday of the resurrection week. So Monday and Tuesday, Monday he comes in and cleanses the temple. Great story, right? Flipping tables, whipping people. I mean, Jesus. Jesus. And then, and then so then he teaches in the temple Monday and Tuesday. Uh, Tuesday, after he finishes teaching in the temple, and then he teaches, remember, on the widow and her two mites. And we, we titled that message, The Big Giver. Because even though everybody else would have said, two mites. You know, it's, it's a dollar, it's whatever. It's a couple pennies, what's that going to do? But Jesus said, no, because she gave him all she had, she's the big giver. And uh, so he leaves teaching in the temple. That was the final message of the temple. They go to exit the temple. As they're exiting the temple, he's just preached some of the most amazing messages on salvation, on being right with God, on service, on being a good steward. All of these things, as they're leaving, everybody's like, wow, look at the pretty rocks. Look at that wall. That's a beautiful wall, isn't it? And they were so focused on the temple and the way it looked that in chapter 21, Jesus had, I mean, he knew he was going to do this, but because of their focus on the temporal temple, temporal temple, yes, I said that right, <laughs> temporal temple, he said to them, that's going to go down. It won't be too long before there's not a stone left on another. And, we, and I don't have time to give you all that Luke 21 was because it was basically four messages and so if you want to go back and listen to those, you can on our YouTube page. Uh, but essentially, he was trying to get them to focus less on the temporal earth and more on the eternal heaven. Yeah. By the way, that's still a struggle today. Yeah. To not be worried about the temporal things of this life, but to be focused on the things that are going to last. Yeah. There's a lot of things we can do today that won't do anything for God. Won't mean a hill of beans in heaven. By the way, one of the good things you can be doing today is be here in the house of God like he asked us to, like he told us to, really commanded. And so we're still on Tuesday. This would have been in the afternoon time, um, coming up on the evening time, and we're going to begin Luke chapter 22. So verse number one of Luke chapter 22. If you're able, please stand in honor of God's word. We'd like to stand in honor of God's word here if you're able. And we're going to read verses one through 13. So I'm taking a big chunk today. All right, here we go. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. Next week I'll talk more about the Passover, so I'm not going to give a ton of details today. Just don't feel like I have that time. So if you're curious about it, stay tuned. Come back next week. Or not next week. Actually, like three weeks from now. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Now, uh, restart. Verse 1. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him. For they feared the people, basically saying they wanted to kill him, but they couldn't figure out a good way because the, the multitude would have killed them. They'd have started a riot. Verse 3. Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. And he went his way and communed with the chief priests and captains, how he might betray him unto them. And they were glad and covenanted to him to give him money. And he promised and saw opportunity to betray him unto them in the absence of the multitude. So he said, I'll find a time when nobody else is around so that when you take him, you won't be mobbed. Verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. And they said unto him, verse 9. Where wilt thou that we prepare? And he said unto them, verse 10, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. And ye shall say unto the good man of the house, The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber? Where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples. And he shall show you a large upper room furnished. There make ready. And they went and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I said you'd help us with this message today. A lot of 
pieces, a lot of parts. Uh, Lord, so help us to make it clear. Be with me as I preach, and to me yourself and the Holy Spirit. Uh, Lord, open up the hearts of your people, convict us, encourage us, edify us. But Lord, I'm already praying that you'd be with the uh, invitation time, the time where people make decisions. If there's someone here that doesn't know you as a personal Savior, Lord, convict their hearts. Let today be their day of salvation. Amen. If they are saved, Lord, help today be the day that they realize something important about your word and what you have for them, and they get that right today. So all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thanks for standing. I've titled the message, Even Then. Even Then. <clears throat> Who here has something you keep around or use that is in really bad shape? I mean, you know that it's like, it's like that thing that like, you know, I ought to throw this away. Yeah. Like this, but you keep it around anyway. You still have it. It's in what, I'll give you some examples. It could be, I know Holly and I had one of these. It was a, it was a pan. And we had got it at Christmas. We'd done a, my family always does weird gift exchanges because the size of us. So instead of buying everybody a present, we just do weird gift exchange games and stuff. And one year we did an As Seen on TV gift exchange thing. And we ended up with, you remember that green non-stick, you know, the never stick that sit there and use a drill on it and you cook eggs and like, you know, you remember that one? We got that one. I was like, actually, that's pretty cool because, you know. My wife cooks, amen? And uh, <laughs> so, that's a good, it's, I like practical, okay? Yeah. And so anyways, we had that pen, and we got that when we were in college, and I think we might have had it even when we moved here, but it was bad. It was like black. You know the point where it's like, you can't scrub whatever it is off of it anymore, or, or you just lost all the coating, yeah. and like, it was no longer non-slip, it was no longer, I mean, it was bad. We finally got away, but we hung on to that thing for way too long. And used it to cook way too many meals that you all ate. Uh, <laughs> Tastes good. Amen. I guarantee, I guarantee, I guarantee this. Every man in this room has some socks yeah. that are just why. Yeah. There's like holes in like four spots, toes hanging out, heels hanging out, the bottom torn off, and yet for some reason. You keep them in your sock drawer like you're going to need one day. And don't call them your church socks either just because they're holy. <laughs> but you're determined that they, they're going to be. I was like, why? Just throw them away. They're gross. Yeah. I don't care if you played your last high school football game in those socks. They're not keepers. How about this? Most of us, and women, I think you're the worst at this, have towels. Oh, yeah. The towels that have the holes in them, <laughs> that are like frayed, like one side, you know, the seam is just gone, it's just frayed. Every time you wash it, you pull it out of the washer or dryer and it's like wrapped into all the other towels because they're string. And it's just like, why do you keep that around? And you're like, well, you know, I, I use it when I take off makeup or whatever. And, I, and you got your excuses. It's like, just, it's, man, it's junk. <laughs> Some of you have, it wouldn't be your daily driver, but it's like a car that, I mean, it's your junker, you know what I mean? Like, you keep it around, you will not maintain it, you will not clean it, you will not do anything for it, but you're going to keep it around for only God knows why, because you don't ever, like, you don't care about it, but you're going to keep it, even though, man, not, most places, not even a junkyard would buy it from you, probably. <laughs> this one's my favorite. All right, we're in church, so remember to be honest. How many in here, it's either in your fridge or in your cupboard, have a spot or a place where you keep restaurant fast food packets of ketchup and stuff. <laughs> yes, like, yes, come on, thank you, you gotta be honest. Why? Okay, if it's Chick-fil-A sauce, I get it. Even though you can buy that in bulk at Walmart, you don't have to save the packets, okay? You can buy Polynesian too, okay? But like, why is there like 50 packets of ketchup in there? There's never once where you're eating something with ketchup where you go, oh, I'm going to grab 10 packets of this ketchup that I kept from McDonald's two years ago and use that. No, you use a bottle. Just throw it away. It's useless. Everyone else would look at these items. Everyone else would look at these items in our house. If they saw the socks, if you saw that pan, if you saw the towels, if you saw the, the whole section of the fridge sanctioned off for fast food, condiments, you would just be like, why do you even use that? It's like, throw it away. I bring that up for this reason. We're all damaged goods. Dirty, kind of beyond cleaning, some of us. Not physically, necessarily. Some of you, physically as well. Um, <laughs> but we're damaged, holy. We're, we're honest, to, honest to goodness, Anybody looking at us would say, why? Would God 
want to or desire to use them. And yet, the God of all the universe looks at that nasty pair of socks, if I could call it that, or that dirty pain, or the holy towel, or the McDonald's ketchup <laughs> packet, and he says, I have a will just for that. No. Before there was Adam and Eve, God had a will for Brother Frank Com Comar. Amen. Right. He knew exactly what he was going to use that packet of ketchup for. God has had a will for a Tristan Weaver. Before there was ever an Adam and Eve, he says, I know exactly what I'm going to use him for. Amen. Can we, first off, let's just sit back for a second and go, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> no, that God, that God would use any of us. Yeah. That God would, and, and if, if you think you're all that in a bag of chips, just come talk to me for a minute, or let me talk to your spouse, and we'll get that settled real quick, how perfect and great you are. But just sit back and think about that. But here, here's where I'm getting. God has a will for your life, and wants to use you. Even though, you're not really worth using. Now, if that is the case, then the logical question that may come to your mind is, how do I know what God's will for my life is? How do I know what God's will for my life is? Pastor, you just said that before God created everything, He knew He had a plan for me. How do I figure that out? That is a great question, isn't it? Yeah. It really is a great question. Like, it, it, it's something that I, I, I've literally read books on trying to figure out God's will. I remember being in ministry before I was pastoring here trying to figure out God's will for my life because it was like I was trying to put a square peg in a round hole. I'm like, okay, God, this doesn't seem to fit. What is your will for my life? What is your will for my family? What is it? What is it? In our passage, Jesus is going to use a couple of the disciples to do his will. And through that, I'm hoping to encourage you and show you how to discover and do God's will in your life. So first, there's going to be four requirements for doing God's will. For knowing and doing God's will. Four requirements. First requirement. You ready for this? First, to know God's will, you have to know God. Oh, we're starting in the deep end. Amen. <laughs> Alright, look back at your passage there. Uh, verses 7-9. through nine. Don't worry, we're going to come back to the beginning of the text. Don't think I skipped it. We will come back. But verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John saying, Go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. And they said unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare? This is getting real deep here. But the disciples, these two men that Jesus asked to do a task, knew who Jesus was. Okay, if that's what you desire, how do we accomplish what you would like us to do? If you want this done, just tell us how to get it done. In our text, he wanted to eat the Passover. That was God's will. And by the way, I'm going to interchange God's will and Jesus' will throughout this whole message. We're not doing a disservice for that. He thought about Robert be equal with God because he right. is equal with God. He is God. So when I do that, don't sit here and go, I thought you said God's will. Now it's Jesus' will. It's the same will. God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit all have the same will for your life. And so... Uh, Jesus' will, God's will was to eat the Passover with his disciples, and it was the disciples' job to get that done, but they had to know Jesus to get that done. Before anyone here decides to try to discover God's will for your life, let's be clear. You have to know God first. You have to know God first. You need a relationship with him. And you may be thinking, well, well, glad you said that because I do know God. I know a lot about God. I know, I, I know an immense amount about God. Well, more than knowing about God, I'm at, I want you to understand you need to know personally God. Amen. I know who Tom Brady is. I can tell you his net worth, or at least the estimated net worth, because now with this divorce happening, or maybe happening, there's a lot of that I have talked out there. I can tell you where he went to college, how many Super Bowl rings he has, which teams he won those Super Bowl rings with. You don't know who Tom Brady is, that's fine. I just picked the famous guy. I know a lot about Tom Brady. I can tell you how he's doing this season in football. Not great. <laughs> Maybe because of divorce. I don't know. <laughs> My point is, I may know a lot about him, but that doesn't mean I know him. The kind of knowing God that I'm talking about is not where you can say, yeah, I know God is the creator of all things. Yeah, I know God. Genesis 1-1. I know God. John 1-1. I, I understand God wrote the Bible. I get all that. I know God. No, no. But do you know him personally? That's right. 
All the knowledge of him in the world doesn't mean anything unless you enter into a, a, a real relationship with Jesus Christ yourself. Is there a time in your life where you realize that God loved you, realize that you were a sinner, and that your sin was going to send you to hell, and that you could not get yourself out of that debt, and then where you understood that Jesus Christ died for your sins and asked him to save you? Has there ever been a time that you've done that? If not, let me encourage you, today could be that day. Before you even leave, we would love to show you, not Peak View Baptist Church's way, not Brother Stephen Jones's way, not the Baptist way. We would love to show you what the Bible says about it. We'd love to. If you don't know that today, we'd love to show you. But if you are saved, let me encourage you, get to know God better. No, get to know God better. And the first step to really knowing and doing the will of God is you've got to know God better. Well, Pastor, you, how do you do that? Use the Spirit. We read that in Sunday school. Now worship him in spirit. Yes, but he's also a very practical God. I love that about our God, by the way. He's practical. He's practical. He said, you boneheads need an instruction manual. So I'll write you one. <laughs> and you Americans need it in your language, because you ain't going to learn any others. <laughs> so God left us his word, so that we can get the mind of God on all kinds of things. In fact, everything you need for life and godliness. It says everything you need. So what am I supposed to do? Well, read it! Yeah. Read it! I know, it's so... We're just... I mean, we went from talking prophecy and stuff these last two weeks. We just dumped right back, jumped right back in the deep end with just read the Bible. If you don't... Li listen, I can't tell you how many times when I was curious about what God's will for my life was that I would turn to the Bible and he'd use some crazy passage like 1 Kings or Ezra or something and something that was in there that I never noticed before or that stuck out to me let me know that's the right thing to do. That's the wrong thing to do. Amen. Go that direction. Flee. It's amazing how God can use his word. Because it's a living word. Right. So, number one. If you want the will of God. If you want to know the will of God in life, you've got to know God. If, that, if you're not saved, that means you need to get saved. And we'd love to show you that today. If you are saved, that means keep getting to know him. Yeah. I didn't get married to Holly and go, now I don't have to learn anything else about her. <laughs> I knew a lot about her before we got married, so we're set now. No, I joke with people. I've been married four times. I married, I, I, I was, I, there was this girl, this teenage girl that I fell in love with. And then there was this, the woman I married. And then uh, there was the, the woman that I had after we got married for about five years. And then there was my wife that was a mom that's completely different from all the rest. And I'm learning and growing with her. God, it wants you to learn and grow with him. You got to know him. You got to get into his words. So number one, requirement for doing God's will is you got to know God. Number two, and that was one of the long ones. Here's another long one. <laughs> we got some short ones too. You'll have to be okay with what God gives you to do. You have to be okay. If you want to do the will of God, then you got to be okay with whatever that is. I know that's another woo, real deep one. Okay, let's get engaged here. How many disciples were there? Not a trick question. How many disciples? Just Twelve. Out. Twelve. Thank you. Twelve disciples. Jesus sends two, Peter and John, to do something. Now, remember, when you read the Bible, imagine some things. Get yourself there. That means there's a one in six odd or chance that you didn't have to do nothing. Okay. Some of y'all are like, yes, okay. That, my math may stink, but fractions I still remember a little bit. I was the one of four children. So I had two brothers and a sister. There's four of us. If my parents called us all in the living room and said, okay, Stephen, you go out back and pick up dog food. The, other, the rest of y'all do whatever you want. What would you think I would have been doing? What about them? Why do I have to be the one to do it? Why is it me? It would have been, it would have been very easy for John and Peter to go, uh, especially Peter because he's mouthy. It's like, Mr. John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Peter, the disciple with the big mouth. <laughs> Pretty sure one of, the, one of those biblical, I'll let you figure out which one. Uh, <laughs> Peter would have just, I can imagine my mind, why do I have to go? No, it's exhausting following Jesus. The dude barely sleeps. He doesn't get enough to eat. He is just go, go, go. Everybody else gets to chill, and I got to go? Why? Have you ever thought that? Why me, Lord? Why do I have to do it? You ever get that, I call it a complex? It's always me. Oh, pastor's going to make mention of the sign-up sheets. Somebody's got to clean the church. I got to sign up. It's always me. I've always got to sign up. I'm always the one that signs up to bring the rice 
Nobody ever wants to bring the rice for, for Belgium. Why is it me that pastor calls when he needs X? Why is it me that he, he calls on for this? Why does it seem like God always wants me? Why do I got to clean the toilets? If it's mowing gospel grass, it's cleaning gospel toilets. Just so you know. But if you ever felt that way, you do understand that's God's will for your life. Well, what about everybody else? John, chapter 21. You can turn there if you want. I don't actually have the verses even written down. But it was after Jesus' resurrection. And he, G Jesus is telling Peter what he wants Peter to do. John's right there. It's the same two guys. John 21. John is right there. This is what Peter says. And what shall this man do? No, that's what he says. Jesus is giving Peter his, his really his commission for him specifically. And Peter's going, but what about him? Yeah. And this is what Jesus said. Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Yeah. If you're ever sitting there going, why is it me? Why do I get, why, does, why, why am I supposed to sign clean? Why am I supposed to give? Why do I have to, why do I have to serve this way? Why does it always seem to be me? Well, God would tell you, don't worry about everybody else. Just follow me. Amen. That's, that's what I have for you. God, why do I always be that one to have to preach? Why do I have to be the one to pastor to these ungrateful people? <laughs> it was, that was a very kind way of Jesus saying, it's none of your business what I ask anybody else to do. You need to just be okay with what I ask you to do. So the rest of the men get to sit and do nothing. But if that's the Lord's will, so be it. Now let's break down what Jesus wanted these two men to do. And before we give you the, the, the other two requirements. So read verse 10 through 12 with me. And he said unto them, Behold, when he entered into the city, there shall a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth. And ye shall say unto the good man of the house, The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he shall show you a large upper room, furnished. There make ready. So let's, let's break this down. So you got Jesus. He tells these two men, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go in the city. The city is in the fire. That's Jerusalem. Jerusalem typically has around 100,000 people, which is a large city. Especially when you live out of Florida. That's a yeah. big city. But as we talked about on Passover, or not Palm Sunday, when Jesus wrote in on the song, during the Passover season, it is, historians estimate that it would swell to almost a million people in Jerusalem. That's a lot of people. Like Denver. I don't know where Denver's at, but I think it's around Denver, I guess. I know it's bigger than the Springs. That's like Denver, people. And so Jesus says, okay, you guys go into the city, and you're going to see a dude with a pot of water, a pitcher of water. Now already, again, if you don't picture what's going on in the Bible, you're not catching all of it. Two guys walk into a city of a million people. That sounds like a bad joke. Sorry, right there. Two guys walk into a city. <laughs> So these two men enter into the city. Now, if it were me, I would be looking for what would stand out, which would be a water pot to me, a pitcher of water, I'm guessing, right? But here's the thing we've got to understand culturally. It was the women who got water, not the men. So maybe because of the swelling of the influx of people, maybe another slave had to get water with another woman, you know, they just needed that much extra, whatever it may have been. So now I imagine they're going, okay, typically every water pot we see is a woman, but we just got to find the dude with the water pot. And so then they see a water pot, right? Oh, no, no, that's a woman. Oh, there's one. That's a big woman. Okay, never mind. That's, that's not her either. Okay, she, I thought, I thought that might have been him. And then right across their path walks a dude with a water pitcher. It's right in front of him. He said, how do you think it's right in front of him? He says, verse number 10, Behold, you're entered into the city. There shall a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. Now, the word meet you there doesn't actually mean he like talks to him. It just means he, he's gonna, you're going to see him. But then it doesn't tell them to go talk to him. No, read it. It says follow him. Yeah. So now they're like, they're like, come on, you know what it's like when you're following somebody that doesn't know that you're there? They've been called that dating for years. <laughs> <laughs> so they're following this man and he, they get to the house and he goes in the house and it does not say knock on the door and ask if you can come in it says go in 
Enter! It's what it says, doesn't it? Enter it in! Are you not imagining this with me? Have you ever just walked into a house somebody else goes in that's supposed to be there and you just walk in like you own the place? I imagine in my mind, they get to the door, they, they watch the guy walk through, so they get to the door, and John's like, go ahead, Peter. <laughs> You're always the one talking anyway, so like, Peter's like, hello? Jesus Christ's disciples, meet you back to church. They come, they, so they walk in, and they find the good master of the house. You say, how would they know which one's the master? Because people have multiple slaves. This guy that walks in was probably just a slave getting water. How do you know? Well, I would, I would venture to guess it's the guy that's not doing anything. Yeah. <laughs> right? I, I mean, they, they, like, that makes sense to me. Everybody else has to work, and he's, he owns the place. He can sit there and be chill. So they walk right up to this guy, and it doesn't say that he was surprised, but I, I'm like, I would be surprised you walk into my house. Thank the Lord there wasn't guns back then, and this wasn't somewhere like Texas. The dude would, they would, the, the, we would be missing two disciples really quickly. Because in Texas, shoot first, ask questions after. You know? So they walk in, and they ask the guy, hey, where, uh, and, and even the way they asked this, I even love what they, they said, the master saith unto thee, where's the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? They didn't come in and say, hey, do you have a room that we can eat the Passover in? That's not what they said. It'd be like if I walked up to Holly and said, there's a difference of this. Would you like to go on a date with me Friday night? Or, hey, on our date Friday night, where would you like to eat? There's a difference there. One, I'm implying, we're going. Pretend she's not married to me because we don't date now. I wish we did, but we have kids. Anyways, um, <laughs> the point is, they walk in and they don't ask, do you have a place? Do you have a room? They said, the master says, where's the guest chamber that we can eat the Passover with his disciples? And, uh, now, two-story home, an upper room is two-story. You're living high in the hog if you have a two-story home. I know for us that's pretty common out here. It seems like all, most houses out here are double two-story. I'm like, why is everything going to be built on a hill? Every driveway is going to be like this. Like, my parking brake is, is murder out here. Anyways, but for them, that would have been something very big. Now, uh, usually, typically for these upper rooms, you would actually have to go outside of the house and go up a staircase to get to the upper room. It wasn't like through the house because the way that it was built is much harder to try to build a staircase in the house. So you'd build it outside of the house. So I imagine this man just gets up and says, I know exactly what you're talking about. Goes right up, takes him right up into this large upper room, which they still have a place in uh, Jerusalem that they assume to be the upper room. You can go see that, I guess. I, I can't tell you that for a fact. And I, they can't tell you for a fact that it is, but they believe it to be. And it's a big enough room for 12 people. It's already furnished, which is awesome because furnishing is great. You ever moved into an apartment that was fully furnished? I haven't either, but I imagine that'd be nice. <laughs> okay. That brings us to the next requirement for doing the will of God. Number one, you got to know God. Get to know him better. Number two, you got to be okay with whatever he gives you to do. Even if it seems like what he's giving you to do is more than what he gives other people to do. It's okay. It means he's trusting you with more. Amen. Number three, you're going to have to, dirty word in our, in our society, 2022, this is where I'm, I'm going to lose people on YouTube. Work. Work. Look back at the passage. Verse number 12. And he shall show you a large upper room furnished. There make ready. So it's already furnished. They find the room. And now I believe, now there's a lot of debate by what furnished means. Did it just have a table and the, the pillow things that they would set on, the chair type things? Or, what, or, or was it already kind of set with wine, unleavened bread, the things that would have been needed for the Passover aside from maybe the lamb? Regardless, there was still some work to be done. If you did move into a fully furnished apartment, you wouldn't walk in and go, well, where's dinner? I thought this was fully furnished. You'd be like, it's got the furniture, you make dinner. It's, it's furnished, not complete. And so they walk in now, and now, I've never personally tried to prepare Passover lamb. I'm not going to say that I know what that's like, but I imagine there's a little bit of work involved, especially back then. Again, they're the two that get to do it while everybody else is doing nothing. Well, we know what Judas Iscariot was probably doing at that time, but everybody else, they're, they're, they have to do it. Many people, many people miss the will of God in their life because it comes disguised as work. Most of the things God wants you to do requires work. The Great Commission is work. Reaching people, trying to tell, you say it's not really work to tell somebody about Jesus Christ. Then you haven't tried it. 
you're naturally offending and hurting people's feelings and trying to tell them that whatever they've believed all their life is most likely wrong. It takes work. It takes work if, you, if they do get saved. Then to help them to understand they need to be baptized. And then to disciple someone. Discipleship is work. It takes preparation. It takes time. It takes thought. And you have to have answers. Preachers here have to have answers. You're supposed to just blindly trust me. No, me. <laughs> blindly follow the Bible. Me, question everything. Most every miracle God did in Scripture, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, aside from creation, most every miracle God did, He used a human. He used a person. <clears throat> Examples, David and Goliath. God didn't just drop a meteorite on Goliath. <laughs> Could have. Yeah. Probably should have. <laughs> 40 days this dude talking bad on God. I've, I've not near as long-suffering as God, because I'd have been like, Oh, you want to see God? I'd have made like a ring of fire on him, so he couldn't run anywhere. Just... And then I'd be like, check this out. And then I'd start throwing smaller meteorites to scare him, so they'd hit the floor and he'd be like trying to run, and then I'd crush him. <laughs> it sounds like the start of a serial killer. <laughs> we won't go there either. No, instead, God said, I have a young man, 14, 15, 16 years old. Now, did David walk out there and, and roundhouse kick him to the face? You know, throw a spear from a... No, he put a rock in a sling. But it was God that guided that rock to his. Right. It was about to sink in yeah. and kill it. Then David did what was... Mm, the sword out. Boom! Took his own head with his sword. And I imagine he walked right back up to Saul and went... <laughs> okay, maybe that's my imagination. <laughs> you imagine that however you want. You could be wrong if you'd like. Uh, anyways, <laughs> no one the flood. God could have saved all the animals and ate people however he saw fit. Right. Instead, Noah had to spend at least 86 years building a boat. That's a long time to serve when you've never once seen rain. Yep. And to believe that there's going to be eventually. Yeah. God does the hard part of the miracle, but he likes to use mankind. God handled all the hard work for him. It's fully furnished. It's pretty much ready to go. They just had to finish out. But most people will never do the will of God because the will of God is almost always going to involve work. But here's the great part. If God's going to give you the work to do, he's going to do the hard parts first. Amen. If God wants you to witness to somebody, guess what? The Holy Spirit's already been working on their heart. Now, you may just be somebody that's planting a seed or watering it, so you might not see the fruit, but God's still doing the hard work behind the scenes. Okay, lastly, the will of God requires obedience. Verse 13. Verse 10 through 12, why we made an imagination of what all happened, that was Jesus telling them what was going to happen. Verse 13 is where they obeyed. Look at verse 13. And they went and found, as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. They obeyed. Not only did they know God, know what he wanted, were okay with the job he gave them, were willing to work, but they obeyed. Some of us are like, I know God. Oh, I, I, I'd be okay with whatever God wants me to do. Yeah, I'm okay even if it's work. And then when it's finally revealed to us exactly what God wants us to do, we go, well, I mean, you do realize I have a life. If I'm here Saturday cleaning the church, I'm... Uh, if I'm out visiting people on Saturday or Thursday, I mean, you do realize, Pastor, I have a job. God, you realize I have a job. And, and it's like, it's all, it's, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to serve. I'll do anything you need, Pastor, just let me know. God, I'm willing. I'm your willing servant. Just give me a job. And God's like, here's somebody in your, uh, that you work with. I want you to witness to you. You're like, well, I mean, I'm at work. I can't. They don't pay me to, to listen to the gospel. And we're always okay with it until it comes time to say, put to action, obey. They obey. All right, let, that leads us to the great truth of God's will. Here's the truth I'd encourage you to take home with you today. If God tells you to do something, God will provide what you need to do it. If God tells you to do something, God will provide for, for what you need to do it. I believe that's why God left this passage in here, because for the most part, and it's in also, it's in Mark as well, it's kind of a, okay, they prepared the Passover, we don't need the details of them preparing the Passover, because it's, it's verse 14 we all get excited about, when we read the Lord's Supper and all that, that's where we get excited. What is all this about? Well, it's about them doing the will of the Lord. Let's go back and just real quick, see all the things that God provided. God provided them with clear instruction and direction. On a specific day, he told them where they were going to go, what they were looking for, what they were going to do. Praise the Lord. 
say, well, God doesn't give me that clear direction. Well, yeah, he really is. Now, there's specific wills for you specifically that he's not as clear on, at least to me. But there's very clear wills in the, in the word of God that he's already laid out. There's no instruction. You don't need to ask if you're supposed to read your Bible every day. That's already that's stated. You don't need to ask if you're supposed to be on, in church on Sunday. That's already stated. You don't need to ask if you're supposed to tithe. I knew it. He's going to figure out a way to talk about tithe. You don't need to ask if you're supposed to tithe. That's already in here. You're not supposed to ask if you're supposed to give above and beyond your tithe because that's also in here. Offering. You don't have to ask those things. You don't have to ask if you're supposed to be a soul winner. That's already in here. You're not supposed to ask if you're supposed to serve in your church. That's already in here. That, God's already given you clear direction. Now, there's more specific that he'll give you as you continue to do what you're already supposed to do. And by the way, if you feel like God isn't asking you to do anything at all, it's probably because you're not doing the things that he's already clearly laid out that you're supposed to be doing. Amen. Because he can't trust you to do the things he's already clearly laid out for you to do. Then why is he going to give you more? Right. Okay. He gave him clear instruction. He provided the specific man. While, imagine this, while Jesus is telling these two guys what they're doing, he was preparing a guy to walk by with water. No, no, like you got to understand, God knew the timing was going to be perfect for them to be walking into the city and it's like, that's our guy. Then God prepared a house. There it was. When it was built, whoever built it probably had no idea that in this upper room, the Lord was going to institute the first Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. Pretty big deal, considering we still do it 2,000 years later. Yeah. Pretty big deal. Churches that we would disagree with strongly doctrinally still do it 2,000 years later. The guy that built that house would have never guessed, but God prepared that house specifically. And then he had the guy furnish it. Could you imagine being the master? And he's like, he's like, hey, uh, servant one, two, and three, I don't know what their names would have been, so. Guys, I need a big table, so go, go buy a big table. I need one that's going to fit about 12 people, roughly. Make sure it's all furnished, get it nice. Go ahead and get everything that we need for the Passover. Oh, we're going to do the Passover here? No, no, we're not. I just know where I'm supposed to put it here. Why? I don't know. I just know I'm supposed to hit it. God did that! Who's to say that this man knew what that, I guarantee he didn't know what that room was for. Now, maybe it made sense once the guy showed up and said, hey, the master's asking, where's the guest chamber? He's like, dude. That's why I got it ready. But God prepared that man. And then God gave them everything they needed for the Passover. I, I personally believe that everything aside from the lamb was ready and they just needed to go kill the lamb. And I bet the, the master of that house had the lamb ready too. Just like, here it is. You just got to kill it and everything. But here it is. When God has a specific plan for your life, he provides everything needed for you to accomplish it. Maybe you're single today. Say, well, am I supposed to get married? Well, if you're supposed to get married, God's going to bring the right one around at the right time. Amen. That's different for everybody, by the way. Yeah. He brought my right one, you know, junior year of high school. Yes. Because <laughs> he knew I was too stupid. If he didn't bring her early, I'd mess it all up. But just because it doesn't work out the way you think it should work out doesn't mean you jump on ChristianMingle.com or FarmersOnly.com, whatever, <laughs> whatever site you're using. If you are so busy trying to find the right one, you're going to exhaust yourself trying to do God's will. Why don't you just let God bring it? Say, well, I, I'm trusting God. I'm just going to, I'm just going to you know, test the waters out. Well, what happens if you're with Mr. Right or when, if you're with Mr. Wrong when God brings Mr. Right? Or Mrs. Right or Wrong when God brings Mrs. Right? Imagine how much extra work it would have been for Peter and John if they, if they walk away from Jesus after he tells them what to do and Peter's like, look, dude. It's always Peter. I imagine. Look, dude, I, I'm looking for some random dude with a water pitcher and then following him into a house and expecting there to be... It's, it's Passover, for goodness sakes. Everywhere is full. By the way, everywhere would have been full. Yeah. The fact that God left a room that could fit 12 people for, for Passover is, again, amazing. Says, I don't, I, let's just find our own place. They would have exhausted themselves trying to do what God had clearly laid out for them to do. If God wants you to be married, God is already preparing that spouse. It's hard to believe. I'm going to pick on Tristan because he's teenage years. It's hard to believe, but there's probably already a young lady that exists that God is preparing for young Tristan one day. That God wants him to be married. And once her blindness sets in, it's God's going to bring her up. Sorry. I love you, Tristan. I know you can take some teasing. 
You make 20 million dollars pink hat all the time. Okay. <laughs> but, but seriously, God's got the right person that is going to be okay with his idiosyncrasies. That's a really big word for weirdness. That's going to be cool with him carrying four guns and six knives. She's going to find it here. I, I, we're, we're laughing, but that's serious. I mean this, I mean this with love. Tristan's a, 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 he's a man's man, but he's a tender-hearted, kind man. Yeah. Amen. I, I mean that, with, and I, it's a compliment. He is a tender-hearted, and, there's, and, and a lot of women run all over that, and use and abuse it. But God's got the right one, who's not going to use and abuse it, who's going to find it endearing, and she's going to meet this, and maybe she already knows him, and maybe it's just when God takes the scales off her eyes, and off of his eyes, and then it, it sparks just start to fly, and she goes, oh wow. And he goes, oh wow. <laughs> the, if God wills it, He'll provide it. You don't have to go searching for it. That's right. Okay. So everybody here is like, I'm married. I'm... Okay. Okay. So you're married. Do you think it's God's will for you to have a good marriage? Yes. Yes. I would argue that more than a good marriage, God says your marriage is supposed to be a picture of how Jesus and the church, their relationship, the love that Jesus has for His church. I would argue that God wants more than you to just have a good marriage. He wants to bless your marriage. You say, well, so, so what are you telling me I have to do? you got to know God. You want to have a good marriage. Know God. That would help. By the way, if you're, saved, if you're married to someone who's not saved, help them to know God, but you're supposed to love them through it and be a witness to them. That's what the Bible teaches. But know God. Accept the role that He gives you in your marriage. Hey, marriages can be very miserable when a woman says, I, but I want to be the leader of the home. I'm sorry, sweetheart. That's not what the Bible said you can do. That's right. Well, I just think he should, well, you know what he should do is love you and you should respect him and you find your role and be okay with your role and then work. Marriage takes work. Amen. If you think it's automatic and it's easy, it's not. It is easy to grow apart. It is hard to stay knit together. That's facts. And then you obey. Men, God says love her. Love her. Cherish her. The Bible says be ravished by her. Be ravished by her. It's alright to be a little animalistic. It's okay with your spouse. No, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not making stuff up. I can take you to the Bible. I can take you many places where you're supposed to be ravished. The idea is, is, is like taking over passion, like boiling over for your spouse. So do that. Love her. Wives, respect him. Hey, treat him like a man. Let him know you know he's a man. Let him know. Thank him for being a man. Don't demean him like our society will for being, well, he's a toxic male. No, he's a biblical, or he should be, if he's being a biblical male. Let, let's clarify. If he's being a biblical male, he's being a biblical male. Compliment him on that. Thank you for providing for me. Thank you for protecting me. Thank you for loving me. Pump his ego up. It's only going to help you. You know what that makes him do? You're right. <laughs> I am the man, ain't I? <laughs> I did put this roof on. I did put this roof over your head, girl. Clothes on them babies' backs. Food in them pantries. You're right. And you know what? He's going to love you all. And, and here's the... I, I know, you, I know I'm, I, I'm being funny, but all that's real. I can take you to chapter, verse, Bible parts of, of the Bible, where I can show you if you're doing your roles and you're obeying and you're working and you know God, how he will knit you two together. And it doesn't matter if you've been married for five years or a hundred years, you're going to be passionately in love with each other and serving God together. Amen. How about your finances? What's God's will with your finances? We want you to be a good steward of it. By the way, God wants to bless you. God is not up there going, oh, just let him mess up so I don't have to give him anything else. God wants to bless you. And while that doesn't have to mean finances, it can mean finances. Right. What am I supposed to do? Well, know God's will. What's God's will? <laughs> We're going to talk about tithe, give. Oh, of course. That's always. No, no, I'm serious. You got to know God's will. Be okay with what it is. It may be that God says you don't get to drive the 2022 Ford uh, F350. You know, Harley Davidson edition. Maybe you gotta drive the 07 Lion Bay. No, I, we're laughing, but that's part of, sometimes that's part of God's, that is God's will. Right. To say, no, no, I'm sorry, you're not gonna get the brand new car because you're gonna get the emissions. So you're gonna drive the old car. Well, I just don't like driving an old car. I want a brand new one. I want the nice one. 
Okay, if God allows you to have those things, I'm not begrudging. I'm not saying if you drive a new vehicle out here, shame on you, you're a sinner, wicked. It's not it at all. But what I'm saying is, you just got to learn to be okay with whatever God's got you. Amen. That's right. If I drive that 08 pickup for the rest of my life, I don't care. Mm-hmm. I'd rather get the missions, personally. Uh, yep. Amen. Okay. Know God's will. Obey and be okay with wherever He puts you. And then work! Mm-hmm. You want your finances to be blessed? He's not going to bless it while you're sitting on the couch doing nothing! If a man does not work, he shall not eat. You want to bless your finances? Get out there and do something. Obey the Bible. We're running out of time, so. Oh, the last, last quick thing here, and then we'll get into the first six verses. One more sermon to preach after this. Okay. <laughs> I believe it's God's will for our church to grow. I believe that. You say, why? Um, because you can't win people to the Lord, get them baptized and discipled, and not physically grow numerically. Now, I am not about numbers, but that doesn't mean that I don't want more. That's right. I want God to bring every person he wants to bring to this church, to this church. Amen. I want God to add every person he wants to add to this church. I believe that's his will. But we got to know God. we got to be okay with what he tells us to do. It may be that God puts you exactly where you're at, at your job, in your family, in this community, because you can reach far more people than just I can. you got to be okay with that. And then you got to work. It takes work to grow a church. It takes work to tell people about Jesus Christ. We're going to talk about that. All that takes work. you got to obey. You may understand all that. You may say, I know God put me in my family. I know God put me in this community. I know I have these ties that pastor doesn't have. And I know, I know I'm here because God wants to see these people saved and, and become part of P.P. Baptist Church and serve the Lord. I know that. Are you willing to obey? Are you willing to tell them? Are you willing to look weird? Are you willing to be the strange... God, most of y'all are weird anyway. Just ex- embrace it and be weird for the gospel. All right, let me finish up. We've got to finish up quickly. Here we go. This is the difficult part. Sometimes God's will is hard to swallow. Verses 2 through 6 detail how Judas Iscariot was possessed by Satan and made an agreement for money to betray Jesus. I don't have to explain that too much. I think we got it just by reading it. But let me tell you why. Most people say it was greed. He wanted money. I think that's part of it, but I don't think that was it. I think Judas started following Jesus because, like all Jews, he thought Jesus was going to set up an earthly kingdom. And he wanted a high position in that kingdom. And then as Jesus continued on, and all these talks about the cross, and all these talks about what Jesus was going to do, he decided he was going to cash in and get out. That's my personal opinion of why. I, I, I could kind of maybe show you from chapter and verse, but I don't know. But we look at that, and, and, and by the way, if that didn't turn your stomach just reading it, hurt your heart just reading it, then you need to get sensitive to the Spirit. Because that knowing somebody that walked with our Savior, who Jesus provided for and loved, and, and, and I have no doubt one-on-one tried to disciple, to betray Him that way, should hurt your heart. But here's the reality. It had to happen. Why? Because God needed, Jesus needed to end up on the cross. It was God's will to bring it about this way. Now, could have God done it some other way if Judas would have followed God's first will, which would be to get saved? Yes, he would have found another way. But God made all this to happen this way. For this reason, Jesus Christ had to be on the cross so that he could die for your sins so that you could be saved today. I want to conclude with this. God's will is for you to go to heaven when you die. That's God's will. If you're not saved, that's the only will God is concerned about for you right now. After you get saved, it it really becomes innumerable, the things he has for you. But till that point, that is all God wants from you is for you to trust His Son who died on the cross for your sins. And if you have not done that, we're about to give you an opportunity. Say, well, I just don't feel like doing it today.